Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I'm your host, Hannah Zuberi, and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. Thank you for joining us on Muslim Network TV, America's only Muslim-focused network. You can always watch us 24-7 on Samsung Galaxy 19, Amazon Fire, Roku TV, and soon Apple TV. With the many struggle, struggles Rohingya Muslims are currently going through in Burma, one issue that we wanted to highlight today is that that deserves more of our attention is the Karen struggle. So a lot of times people, when they think about Burma, they often, especially uh, in the Muslim community, think about the Rohingya people. But many minorities in Burma are struggling. Tens and thousands of Karen people have faced impending genocide, torture, and gang rape. Hundreds and thousands of civilians are being displaced throughout the course of the conflict, many of whom who have never who have fled to neighboring Thailand and are still currently confined to refugee camps. Joining us today is Myra um, Dage. Damayer, you'll have to help me correct your the spelling, the pronunciation of your name. I don't want to uh, butcher it. Um, Dagipao. Dagipao. Myra Dagipao is a Karen human rights activist from Karen State. This is in the eastern side of Burma. She was an inter internally displaced person and a refugee prior to resettling in the United States. Since the age of 13, Myra has played a strong role in her community as an organizer and a human rights activist. Previously, Myra worked on a human rights advocate at the United Nations with the Burma Fund United Nations Office. Prior to taking on the managing director position at the US Campaign for Burma. Thank you so much today for joining us today, Myra. Thank you for having me. Um, we wanted to first learn a little bit about your, you, your story. Um, so you've been here in the United States since what age? Um, so I came here since 2004. Okay. Um, yeah, as a result of running away for life. Hmm. And what, so were you uh, born in Karen State? Uh, where were you born and where is your family from? So I was born in Eastern Burma, Korean state, like you said, um, but I was born as an IDP. So basically, literally in a very remote area in Korean state jungle. Mm -hmm. And um, I've lived a life as an internally displaced person for at least 10 years uh, before I, I came to the, the border area where um, it was bordering with Thailand and Burma. So, of course, being uh, an internally displaced person is um, life wasn't, you cannot really uh, predict uh, what it is going to go on with the next day or next week or next month. Mm -hmm. Because at the time when I was a child, uh, the situation in Korean state was very fragile. Um, and the Burma army always came out looking for what they are doing in the Rakhine state right now, looking for civilians who might have connection with the Korean army. If that's so, then they capture, they kill, they torture, they use human as, um, they use civilians as human shield and of mm -hmm. course rape and all this stuff. So every time when uh, the Burma came into our village, we literally have, have to flee for like cats and dogs running out from the from the porch of the, the, the shed and literally running away without anything on our back. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the life I've lived. Um, and sometimes I had to sleep in the rain when there was a top for each person. I still remember sleeping with part of my body was in the rain. And there were a lot of times when there was no food and I was the youngest. So I get to eat mm -hmm. a lot of times. But those who are a bit older than me, my sister above me, a lot of times she was starved. 
So that was the first part of my life when um, I came about. And I've lived that life. My villages were burned down. The reason why I'm saying my villages is because I have lived in several different villages. Mm -hmm. So saying we, we fled from one village and uh, the Burma would come in, uh, came in and then uh, burned down the whole village onto the ground so that we cannot come back and relieve. And on top of that, they planted landmines so that nobody can come back forever. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to keep moving on from one village to another to the point where we finally made it to the Selwyn River, which is the one of the main river in Burma, bordering Burma and Thailand. Only then, then uh, things was a bit calm down for a little while. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, um, the Burma army finally also came to the border and uh, burned down our village. So yeah, that life never end. And um, can you tell me, um, just for our audience who might not know, what what is the difference between um, uh, Bamas and Karen people? What are the main differences? And were you uh, can you tell me a little bit of history about the Karen people? Well, uh, prior to colonization, mm -hmm. every ethnic group in Burma they have their own little territory where they have their own king, their own queen, for instance, even like Karen, they have their own uh, uh, independent territory where they have their own chiefs and all those stuff. And we have that for every other ethnic groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, but then when uh, during the Second World War, uh, the Karen are, were considered as the very faithful ally of the British. Mm -hmm. And which they were, and many other ethnic groups in Burma as well, including Kachin Chin and all those people. Um, and then, so right by the end of the Second World War, um, the Quran was asking for independent state. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ally, which was British, once promised that they will give the Quran the independent state. But then when the war was over, British, uh, when the Quran went over to British to ask for their independent state, then the British said, well, you have to work out, work it out with the Burman, the majority oh. Burman. Mm -hmm. And of course, Quran with good faith, trying to work it out with um, the majority Burman, but apparently it didn't work out because the Burman uh, sort of, uh, they look at the uh, Quran as the British ally and they don't trust the Quran. But at the same time, the Quran also cannot trust British, uh, cannot trust Burman because when, when uh, uh, Burman went to Japan and uh, brought back uh, Japanese, that's when the Quran minorities, the Quran ethnic group have to suffer very brutally at the hands of the, the, the Japanese. And so with all those uh, complications that has happened between them, um, and then trust is very hard to build up. But at the same time, the Quran was still willing to negotiate and talk. Mm. And uh, they, they tried to work until the end to the point where they figure, no, these Burmans are Burman. Because um, when they started um, the the they started the negotiation talking with the Burman. They could, back then they had very strong um, manpower in terms mm -hmm. of fighting as well as very intelligent, smart people who, who have been working in the Burmese uh, government, but now moving back to the Korean uh, side because they feel as though the autonomy, the freedom that they've been asking for haven't been heard or mm -hmm have been neglected or ignored. And that is why now they come back and they work together. They could have maybe capture Rangoon and then there could be something totally different these days, who knows. But because of their sincerity of wanting freedom and self-determination, but not wanting to take over everything. Mm -hmm. And so, Rather negotiate and get good 
things out of it. But then back then, Unu was trying to persuade the Karen that, okay, let's work it out mm -hmm. and then see how far we can go. But then when, the, the, uh, when Unu was trying to say, uh, let's work it out secretly here, mm -hmm. the, the distress coming from here, secretly behind the scene, they're trying to work on their own, uh, their, their own uh, uh, forces, their, their own uh, arrangement, how to get rid of the Korean population, Korean race. And this is not just the Korean population. They're trying to do this with every other ethnic group. And now closer, closest to us, the Rohingya population. This is what they've been ha having doing forever. So and so this is how the Korean revolution come about. Mm. How long has the revolution been taking place? Since um, January 31st, 1949. 1949, so it's been yes. several decades. And um, yes. uh, what has been the repercussions? Of, so can you tell me at this point, um, do the Karen people themselves consider them a, an autonomous part of Burma or a separate part of, you know, how, how, how do the Karen people see themselves? Well, it's a hard, it, it, it's a kind of hard to say. I mean, we do want to consider ourselves uh, to a certain extent. Uh, the Korean people con consider themselves as uh, freedom fighters mm -hmm. because we do fight for freedom. And uh, for quite a while, mm -hmm. we have uh, settled at the Mui River Bank, the Korean headquarters called um, Manaplo. Mm -hmm. And it was lasted for uh, a good 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have our own education, uh, health, all, um, all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, departments that one would have in each country. We're trying to have as many department, uh, departments as we can. We run our own little area, which we call Kothule, mm -hmm. because the state, you... Um, it's kind of like a little messy where we, the the ones who joined the revolution, lives in, we would call it Kothuli, whereas other parts where you see uh, the mixture of Burman and other uh, ethnic uh, groups, saying uh, back in uh, Delta, um, those we cannot consider the area as uh, Kothuli because we don't have the, the power to govern. So we had our own little area for quite a while, but then um, in late 19, uh, uh, sorry, in early 1995, that's when the Burma army, with uh, help from the Korean Democratic, uh, Korean Buddhist Democratic Army, uh, captured the headquarters. And that's when um, I became a refugee, had to flee overnight into the Thai soil. So um, I can, uh uh, you you said the Karen Buddhist army, so that's separate from uh, what, what religion do majority of the Karen follow? Well, the Karen originally, but then also um, later on, you have uh, American missionary, Christian missionaries came into the country and then converted a lot of Karen, but also at the same time, a lot of Karen who lives in the uh, who lives inside the, uh, okay, when I say inside, it means closer to the cities, the towns, going over to uh, where the Burman majority lives and also where the Buddhist monasteries and all those uh, uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see a lot of Buddhists. So I would say maybe um, there's a good number, maybe at least 30 to 40 a percent would be Buddhist, and then another 20, 30, maybe uh, Christian. And then we have very minority. Uh, enemies is a minority now, and of course, some sm a small amount of Muslims. So, yeah. Okay. And a large, I mean, about maybe our audience would be interested in knowing that the largest percentage of refugees that come to the United States are from Burma. Uh, how many of that percentage yes. are Karen? I would say at least 80 to 85 percent, I would say. And where are most of them settled? Um, 
this settle around the country. Uh, right now, um, more and more locations are becoming bigger and bigger because of the secondary migration. So, for instance, if you go to right now Utica, upstate New York, Buffalo, those communities pretty big, as well as if you go to um, St. Paul, Minnesota, for, for instance, or um, uh, in Texas, Houston, Texas, or some uh, some other uh, big cities. So um, basically they are located in pretty much, I would say at least 45 states, mm -hmm. whereas some uh, community will be bigger than others because some communities have been uh, settled for longer time. For instance, like St. Paul, Minnesota has been there Hmm. I would say maybe at least 15 to 20 years almost. So, yeah. That's interesting. So, um, and how uh, how active is the Karen community, um, civically engaged? Uh, and what what is their goal, um, the advocacy goal here in the United States? Um, I, I think... It, there is two parts in terms of their their civic engagement. Uh, firstly, those who resettle in the U.S., uh, I'd say maybe 40%, uh, no, 60% of them came from very uh, rural area, and mm -hmm. a lot of them uh, are illiterate. Mm -hmm. So... They more focus on their day-to-day -day, uh, life, mm -hmm. how, where to work, how to work, how to make a living and feed their family. Okay. Whereas you also have uh, another much smaller group where uh, they get some education in the refugee camps, mm -hmm. but then still a lot of there is a big uh, issue with language barriers. So they may know how to do a lot of things. For instance, some of them have been medics, teachers, um, educators in the camp at, back in uh, in Thailand, uh, refugee camps, or even back in Korean state, uh, the Kotuli uh, control area. But because of the language ability, so when they get here, their language, uh, uh, the, their capability is not there. And therefore, they ended up working at the meatpacking meat plants or um, some other um, low paid jobs. Mm. But uh, we also have very few who make their way to uh, uh, better jobs. Some of them work in the medical field, some of them work in education field, um, very few of them. But thankfully we have the younger generation who now uh, picking up like every other immigrants and refugees trying to pick up and make their way to a better place, higher place in the, in the job. Uh, world. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, they have very little uh, uh, knowledge and understanding about advocacy. But mm -hmm. comparing from then and now, now they're get, becoming much better. We have a lot mm -hmm. of communities who have communicate, communicated with uh, their officials, whether from local level as well as uh, state level. They, all, they already have those, and a lot of them already advocate for on health issues, local health and education is issues, and uh, especially social welfare, because those are the stuff that the community need most at this point. But also the good thing is that um, me working in DC at the national level, mm -hmm. um, I can always count on them. That's a good thing. They're very supportive. And that is not just the current community. When I need any help with a signing petition and all those stuff, mm -hmm. I would email to call up um, every other ethnic group leaders, uh, local leaders, and then they will be very supportive and helping me gather organizations or names and all those stuff. So. And basically, they do understand that there is advocacy, the purpose for advocacy. Mm -hmm. It's just that they, they don't understand it to the extent that we do and how to do it. And also, they don't have enough time to put in the time and effort. But yes. when we need it, their help, then they are very supportive. So that's and another... It's a privilege, too. It really is, because yes. it does. Uh, I have... Um, you know, there were pictures that came out from the Iowa caucus where 
Burmese groups over there had caucused with Bernie Sanders, and that was like a pivotal moment of seeing that inside a church. Yes. Um, so, yes. yeah, so that was something. Now, constrain the recent shift in the political climate in the United States and the ideologies of our current political administration, do you think the United States is still an integral part of building and maintaining democracy in Burma? Um, that's a very good question. I think it has so much to do with our leadership here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Donald Trump has the political will, he could enact um, the the bills that uh, President Obama suspended. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, like Freedom and Democracy Act, um, he can do that. Mm -hmm. He can continue um, adding uh, the perpetrators onto the, the targeted sanctions list, including Mi Onle himself. Um, in Congress, they have a lot of power to pass the bill, but the problem is we have Mitch, Mitch McConnell sitting on the, the bills. Okay. And so if there's anything that has to do with Aung San Suu Kyi, then he wouldn't move anything. If that is the case, then uh, it tells us that uh, it is very worrisome um, because they are the people who have the power, but they are also the people who want to hold everything against the... And Myra, you've been working on this cause. The people who need their help. For a really long time. Can you tell us more about this relationship that uh, Mitch McConnell, Senator Mitch McConnell has with Aung San Suu Kyi, which has put a hurdle into getting any, um, you know, substantial work done on Burma by the US government? Well, I believe, uh, I mean, I, I heard from him once. I don't remember exactly when, when and where was that. Mm -hmm. But um, Tasuchi is admired of uh, what's going on in the country as a whole. But because Aung San Suu Kyi was willing to give up her freedom and uh, stand up for the people back in, I uh, started from 1987-88 until uh, to this point. So basically, he admire her, but he does not. To to to, to my uh, my point of view, he doesn't admire the overall uh, suffering of the people and the difference that uh, people are trying to make collectively. Whereas, uh, comparing to the late uh, Senator McCain, he doesn't look at. He admired uh, Aung San Suu Kyi a whole lot, but at the same time, he understood that the suffering of the people, the minorities, the majority, everyone's work in the country is a collective effort in order to bring about national reconciliation, national change of the country. So that is the difference between when one person look up to her mm. as her... Uh, admirer, whereas the other person look at the country as a whole. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then anything that would harm her reputation, he's not going to touch it. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very hard for us, the advocates, those who are doing the work here, to move him to do something, to do anything, because he's not going to do anything. True, true. Um, my other, uh, let's go back to current state. Um, uh, there some from Karen State have migrated or fled as refugees to Thailand. Um, mm -hmm. So how many approximately, how many refugees are at the Thai-Burmese border? And how do you think uh, human rights organizations can protect these large groups of refugees? Well, if you ask for the number, it's very hard to say because people keep coming in and then another group resettle in the U.S. in other parts of the, uh, the, the world, whether in Canada, Australia, or Europe. So the numbers, um, it, it's very hard to say how much the number could be. I would say maybe at least 200,000 to 300,000. Um, 
but of course there is a, there is also a number where they try to go back to the Korean side to see if they can go back to their village and work on their farm and all those stuff. So we it's like uh, the number is very fluctuated. So it's very hard to say um, total how many might be. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have the situation where um, uh, there are people who would stay and uh, trying to find their way in uh, to see if they can maneuver through Thai uh, system and then uh, they can live two lives. One side is in refugee camp and another side is living inside Thailand as uh, migrant workers. So basically both sides, um, living in as a migrant worker, <clears throat> they may be able to make some money, but then of course uh, life is not safe because they can be subjected to uh, arrest and torture and all kinds of uh, abuses anytime. Whereas living in the refugee camp, yes, if you are inside the refugee camp behind the, the wire, then you are somewhat safe. So that's different. Um, will the human rights organizations uh, protect these people? No. Human rights organizations also are subjected to a lot of Thai laws. Mm. A lot of them work, but also having to make sure that they don't cross the boundary. Mm. Sometimes some of the work you have to cross the boundary. There is no way that you cannot cross the boundary. If that is the case, then the life is in danger. And that is why a lot of offices have to close down, either close down mm -hmm. or work discreetly, not letting anybody know where the, uh, their whereabout. So I, I would say the human rights organization, unless the registered and also international human rights organizations or international NGOs, then they have different status. But mm -hmm. the organization that I used to work for before, no. We're trying to do the best we can for the people and also making sure that we don't get arrested at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I know you have um, to, you know, you have an appointment and you have to go. So I wanted to wrap this up by what are your, um, if, if you could have your way and things were going exactly according to your activism and uh, goals for your advocacy, where, where do you think, what would you like to see happening in 2020 for Burma, especially for the Korean people? Well, the most important thing is safety and security mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the opportunity to have the basic rights that every other people have, the rights to education, rights to health, the rights to live a normal life as a human being. Mm -hmm. And those are the most basic rights that we all are entitled to as human being, but this is not the thing that we have. Mm -hmm. So if the government can uh, consider the Korean population as well as every other ethnic groups as the people of Burma, there will be a big step. Mm. Number two, if we are allowed to be the citizens of Burma, meaning that we are recognized with formally with identification, with some level of education, health, and all those stuff, if we can have access to everything that the Burman majority in Rangoon and Nipido has, mm -hmm. that's the very most important thing. Mm -hmm. And if the Burma army come to the realization that oh, all these people are human beings. Why we have to keep go out and keep killing them instead of living, living in peace and harmony? So stop sending out their troops, take their troops back because we don't need them. Mm -hmm. And then clear out the landmines so that people can come in and come back in and work in their lands because their security is very important. If the landmines are still there, if the Burma army is still there, there's no safety, and therefore there's no security, and there's no peace then. That's so true, that is so true. Well, we're here with you in your struggle, 
Um, this is one of the most beautiful part of this um, activism has been getting to know on an intimate level all these different people of Burma. And um, this is, you know, it's been really, really, uh, I've learned so much from you. And uh, this is something that we have to continue working on because the, you know, the genocidal regime that focused their attention on Rohingya in 2017 have continued to focus their same attention on um, the Quran people, the same military, it's the same regime and their hate does not stop. And mm -hmm. this is something that we just have to, you know, liberation is tied together. And until if you're getting rid of that military stronghold over that beautiful country would make so many people, you know, live peaceful lives. So Indeed, that, that, that's very true. And I wanted to leave our audience with one last point is that um, Burma, the Burman majority, which is in the power, ever since the, the Burma got independent. Mm -hmm. They've been ruling Burma with the system, the tactic of divide and rule. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Some people may ask. They're trying to put us in our own little box so mm -hmm. that we don't know what's going on in the Western side of the country or the Northern side of the country. Mm -hmm. Giving you my, for my own example, I didn't learn about Rohingya population until 2007 when I did advocacy at the UN. All of a sudden I read about the boat people and I was just like, oh my goodness, here mm. is another group from Burma and I don't, why? I never know about them. Mm. Because it, when I live in the refugee camp, we have some Muslim uh, people, but very few, of course, just two, three families. So now I found another big group and I was just like, seriously, are they the people mm. of Burma? And then I started Googling, I started reading. So this is just to give you a little gist mm -hmm. of how they use the divide and rule policy so that we don't know each other. And that is why when they fight us, we think they fight us alone, but apparently no, they don't fight us alone. They fight everybody in the country, but if they fight everyone at once, they were not going to be able to win. And that is why they have to go piece by piece by piece by piece. That is so profound. That is so profound. Thank you so much for being here, Myra. And uh, we love to have you back on. Uh, this was an introduction to the uh, the Quran struggle, and we want to really dig deep into it uh, and educate our audience. So we'll have you back on. Great, great. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. You can continue watching us on Muslim Network TV, on Galaxy 19, Amazon Fire, and Roku TV. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>